All right, uh, my name is Selena. For those of you who haven't seen me up here before, I'm just here to help introduce our speakers and get things underway. And I'm here right now to introduce Digant, who um, is at Stanford University. Um, and he built and managed uh, many of their systems in the configuration management infrastructure from 2005 to 2010. Um, he brought Puppet to Stanford in 2005 and helped spec many of the features that are used today. Um, he helped drive the server to admin ratio higher, which I'm sure was wanted at Stanford. Um, and now he is, I think, officially in system administration recovery uh, because he is now the lead middleware dev. Um, but he still is in charge of the central puppet infrastructure. So please welcome Diggin. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, not, not a lot of you, but I'm glad you guys came. Um, so, Sunny, my name is Diggin Cassandra. Uh, I'm at Stanford University. And um, we've been using Puppet for a long time. So we'll give you a little bit of history. So what I want to talk about today mostly is, is kind of cultural-based stuff. You know, what it is that we do and how we manage Puppet at Stanford and how we built a culture around that so that some of these practices, because as Luke talked about, you know, Puppet is more than just technology. So you guys heard a lot of great stuff on the technology and how people are using it. And, you know, it's really fabulous stuff. But if you can't integrate this into how you think and how the rest of your team thinks, then you can really get into trouble. So, so that's exactly where we started. And is this mic cutting out, in and out, or are we good? Okay, cool. I won't. Um, so, so what we wanted to do, you know, when we first started out, we had a real problem. So the problem is what you have when you have, and you have a large shop. Uh, and for us, it was only like 15 people at the time. We had this problem where our servers weren't configured consistently, right? So we have, uh, I, I kind of call it like the artisanal model where, you know, we have some servers and they're, you know, they're John's. And John has this particular bouquet of server. Then over here we have Fred, you know, and Fred likes his server spicy, you know, so they're a little bit spicier and different. And we, you know, it's like, that's cool, but it doesn't really work, doesn't really scale well. So we wanted to get rid of that. And we also needed to have a consistency of practice, right? So one of the things you have to kind of do as a team when you come together is you got to all agree to to kind of do things the same way. You know, you got to kind of, you know, it's like not everybody's going to win, not everybody's going to lose, but you got to go, you know, okay, this is the way we're all going to configure Apache. This is the way we're all going to configure SSH because if you don't, you get a real scaling nightmare, right? Because what happened when Fred, you know, gets hit by a bus, right? Now John's got to take over the server and uh, he's not going to have a really easy way to kind of uh, go forward. So. Um, let me go back a little bit. So we wanted to, uh, so we wanted to look at something like Puppet. So we, we looked at configure, uh, configuration management systems. We look at CF Engine, and uh, you know a lot of what I'm going to talk about is a repeat of a lot of other people have talked about. So I'm going to just, you know, mix it up with some personal stories. Uh, so because I think Luke is not in here, right? Okay, so cool. So this is what happened. This is what really happened. Uh, we wanted to look at configuration management systems. So we put out an RF, RFC, uh, and we got some. We got a lot of companies that said, yeah, here's what you can do with CF Engine, and CF Engine's awesome. And I already decided CF Engine was pretty much crap. Uh, I didn't want that. I wanted a different way to look at stuff. I wanted models uh, where I could say, this is the way my world should look, and I want a system that builds that. And we got this one really interesting RFC from this guy in Tennessee. And I, when I got that, I was like, really, Tennessee? Do they have computers in Tennessee? Is anybody here from Tennessee? No? Okay, good. They apparently have three computers in Tennessee. And Luke had one of those computers. And so he was doing cool computer shit with it. And, uh, and so, so we got this guy in, and he comes in, and uh, we brought him in a contract. This was five years ago, when one of the oldest users of Puppet at Stanford. Uh, we brought him in on exactly this day. Actually, this is exactly the day our Puppet, you know, it's kind of like when uh, in Terminator, uh, when Cyberdyne goes live, right? This is the day our Puppet infrastructure went live. This is the minute our Puppet infrastructure went live, okay? So we brought Luke in. It was Reductive Labs at the time. There's only one guy named Luke. He comes in. This is the day we brought her. And the reason I know this, okay, the reason I know this is because this is the exact time five years ago that our Puppet CA sign, our, our Puppet CA cert was signed. Has anybody else used Puppet for coming up on five years? No? Okay. So as soon as your Puppet CA cert comes up and it expires, everything dies. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we figured this out. Uh, 
So I got a call on August 24th, 2011, which was just a, a little while ago, at 2.10 p.m., and everybody said, uh, what the hell is happening? And I said, I don't know, what do you mean? And they said, nothing is doing anything. All the puppet systems are down. And that freaked me out a little bit, and it turned out it was because our CA cert had expired. It was a five-year cert, and it expired. So we know to the day when, uh, when Puppet went live. Uh, we, we resigned the cert. Everything went OK. Um, so to this day, we have about 73,000 lines of code in Puppet. That's a lot of manifests to read, right? So once again, we get everybody that's going to use the same system. Now you have to deal with how do we all work together on this thing so it's not a big, bloody mess, right? We have 1,784 classes. That is a lot of classes. Right? We're a small organization, but the reason we have such a diversity of classes is because at Stanford, we're a decentralized organization. So we have the, the servers that we run internally, right, which is the right way to do it. And then we have clients who have their own right way to do things, and then they have other needs. And so we have some very different models. Right? We can't just say, this is the way a database server works throughout Stanford, because that doesn't fly. Anybody here work at higher education institutions? OK, so you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Everybody has their own IT shop, and everybody's IT shop has the one right way to do things. So you, we have to have different models to kind of spec for all these things. So we have a lot of uh, different classes, but we have only 20 sysadmins. We have 20 sysadmins. They don't just do full-time sysadmin. We do project work. We do a lot of other stuff. And we have about 500 systems, which is not a lot these days, but at the time was uh, considered pretty amazing. Um, so we have four puppet masters, two puppet queue servers. Uh, I don't think anybody cares about how many Puppet Master, Puppet Q servers we have. So, um, <clears throat> so we're gonna talk to you a little bit about is, is kind of coding practices. And what I mean by that is, isn't you know, what manifests you write or here's some cool puppet tricks, but just how you write. You know, what's the way, way to think about things? I have this little spiel on puppet, you know, packages versus puppets that I wanna give, which is not really related, uh, but it's something I feel strongly about. Team practices, how do you work it together as a team? What are your team practices should be? What are the kinds of things you should, you know, culture you should try to cultivate? Server practices, and then ITIL, and uh, crap that management cares about. So uh, anybody here heard of ITIL? Right, okay. Have your bosses heard about ITIL? Right, okay, good. So there's ways that you can do, and I know Puppet Enterprise is looking more towards this direction too of how to interface with that. Um, so we're at Stanford, we're, we, we focus mostly on the open source stuff. Uh, we're not a Puppet Enterprise consumer at this point. Uh, we're big supporters of the open source software. Um, so, Anyway, so let's start with that. So let's talk about coding practices. <clears throat> when I talk about coding practices, I think there's, there's three major things. A style guide. Uh, I wrote one of the original style guides. It was based on what I came up with with Luke, and, uh, and he came up with internally when we had a bunch of people writing code, right? So you've got hundreds of lines of code. If you're coding in anything else, you want to have a style guide, right? So the same thing happens in Puppet. There's a couple of reasons. One of them is because it just makes it easier to find things. But the second thing is it's actually more taxing on your brain to read stuff that's formatted improperly. So I, it's not just that I'm OCD. I swear to God. Uh, so style guides. Let me give you some examples. What is legible, easy to parse code, right? If you're looking at 100 lines of code, things matter, right? So if you're looking at something that's not that big, then it's OK. But the bigger your group gets, right, the worse your code is going to get, the uglier the code gets. Has anybody else seen this happen? Right? If you're writing by yourself, your code looks pretty good, right? But then the next guy comes in, and he likes his curly braces at the end of things, not at the beginning of things, right? OK, that's cool. You get two different ways, right? Now your third guy comes in. He's got a different way of doing things. And the fourth guy and the fifth guy. And then you got this one guy who's just lazy, who just doesn't give a shit where anything goes. I do apologize. I do tend to cuss. I hope I don't offend anybody. Um, and if I do, then go. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so the code gets uglier and uglier. So that was one of the problems that we had to deal with uh, early on, is we have to say, OK, we, we got to agree on a coding style. Uh, Puppet Labs has a style guide. It's on the web. Uh, it's based on some of the earlier work that I did. Uh, there's got some new stuff for some of the new features in there. I suggest everybody take a look. Has everybody looked at the style guide? Who in here has not looked at the style guide? OK. So I would suggest you look at it. You don't have to adopt that style guide. Make your own. It's OK. But, but it's a good starting point. And if you're working with multiple people, it will really help. Um, the other thing is the, the bigger the manifests get, you know, the harder they are to parse. So like I said, we have about 71,000 lines of code total. So when I'm scanning through that, trying to figure out you know, where is this thing misconfigured or where am I, you know, in what manifest am I installing this particular package, if it's parsed out nicer, it makes it so much easier to read. 
So here's a, just kind of a quick example. I'm just gonna, I'm, for, this ex for the couple of examples, I'm just gonna talk about something simple, right? These little arrow things. And uh, shame on Luke for not following the style guide in his earlier talk. I'm gonna talk to him about that. Uh, but this is okay, right? This is, this, is, this is a valid manifest, this will work, this will compile just fine and it'll run. And, uh, and this is actually not that hard to read. But if you had you know, 300 lines of this stuff, it could get a little taxing, right? I just want you to just compare this to this, right? Look how much nicer that is to read, right? You get your tango, it's alpha, you can look down, you can easily parse if it's present. Everything is just nice, it makes it easier on the eyes to do. So these are the kinds of things I'm talking about. When your whole group says, okay, these are gonna be our style guides, and we start coding to that, it makes it easier to work together. And you don't have that annoying guy, right? It, it, again, come together as a team and come up with a style guide because then you don't have to get mad at one dude who's gonna eventually get punched. Uh, it happens. These are just the, this is just the industry we work in, people. I think we all know this, right? People get hit a lot. It's a very violent industry. Uh, <laughs> packages, so here's another one. This one actually, uh, if you, this one, I, I have a, you know, a slight disagreement with some of the ways that, uh, that, that the current style guide talks about. This one, you know, we're talking about putting packages as a different element and everything. I kind of like to group things together, right? So if you're looking at this, you know, and it's going on and on and on and on forever, and you're trying to figure out one particular package in this manifest, is it being installed or not? I mean, you can do a grep, you know, there, there are tools for that. But, it, but that's just a mess to read, right? But if you had it all kind of blocked nice and easily like this, this makes it a lot easier to read. And I swear to you, this will make a huge difference, you know? And if the chicks see this, you will get laid. I swear <laughs> to God. They love this stuff, you know? It's not true, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I made that up. I can make up stuff, it's okay. Do you have a question? How do you feel about uh, using square brackets to make it better rates, doing like where it's all in a sure So the question was, how do I feel about using square brackets to make it into an array so that it's all ensure present. I love it, I think it's a great idea. You know, and I, and I recommend it too, and that kind of stuff is in the style guide, and, and I do, and I think it, I think it works great. Um, you might have to think about it, you know, if you had 500 things in an array, why would you have 500 packages in your manifest? I don't know, but maybe you do. We actually have one manifest that has about 200 packages that we're installing. Do I want to scroll down to the end of the array to figure out if I'm ensuring present or if I'm ensuring default, right? It's a small thing, right? It costs you about two milliseconds of your life. Those two milliseconds could change everything. It could. No, it won't. <clears throat> so yeah, I think square brackets are great. Um, <clears throat> so legible and easy to parse, I think, is a good thing. Uh, sensible chunks of code, right? The cool thing about Puppet is you can put anything anywhere, right? It does a graphing model, and it all works out. So it's got this magic, and it's like, this thing depends on this thing, and that thing depends on another thing, and it just and it runs, and everything just kind of works beautifully, right? But I don't have a graphing model in my head. So I'm looking at a manifest. It's awesome if everything is put, put into chunks, right? Here's where I'm doing my packages. Here's where I'm doing my services to ensure what's present. At the very bottom is where I put my files. Things like that. You know, you can develop an ordering scheme. You can say, uh, you know, okay, we're gonna always define users at the top. Um, you know, we're gonna always define, you know, uh, systems that we're doing overrides on towards the top because that makes it easier. So these are things that you should just think about. But if you just do it randomly, which you can do, it becomes a mess, right? Because if I can't figure out why this package is installing, it's not near the other hundred packages you're installing, it's actually towards the bottom for no damn reason. Uh, you know, <clears throat> it gets annoying. Reusable code. Uh, there's about, f I think, 22 people talking about reusable code at this conference. So hopefully you'll catch one of those people. Uh, modules, for instance, uh, I, I, think, I think Puppet has a great, uh, what is the module repository thing called? Who uses it? The Forge. Yes. Forge is awesome. Uh, when modules first came about in Puppet, you know, the, the whole idea of kind of encapsulating things was great. So here's a problem that happens in your team, right? You've got one guy that thinks, um, you know, modules are awesome, so I have a module for a server. And then you have another guy that's going, you know what, everything should be a module. You know, every package should be a module, every single letter should be a module. How do you balance that out, right? How do you go from having one giant monolithic module to having, you know, way too many modules, right? So one of the things we have to do internally is we have to start seeing, okay, what is actually reusable? What is this, you know, who is actually gonna install this package in multiple places in different ways that necessitates a module? If it's just you, man, you can't alone create 23 modules for your project, you know? It's just not that special. 
but it becomes useful to do. So, so finding that logical barrier, you know, sometimes you have modules that now have to get subdivided into smaller modules. Um, Apache is a great one. One of the things we found is that Apache is configured slightly differently for things like Red Hat and things like Debian. And we're a big Red Hat and Debian shop, and that's pretty much all we do. So now we have to start breaking things down even further. So there's a trade-off between modules, right? And some of these things are solved with uh, things like parameterized classes and defined types. But the problem is how many instances do you, are you going to have, right? One of the things you have to look into is not having 16 different modules for 16 different flavors of the same thing. So having a strategy around that is a good idea. And, uh, and you really want to kind of think, think of that stuff up. Uh, modules into subclasses uh, and, and, and other classes. So one of the other things we found, like I said, we have thousands of lines of code. One of the things we found at Stanford is if we have a module that is over like say 500 lines of code, that's probably too hard to read at any one time, right? So one of the things we started doing is breaking this down into subclasses. So we would have a subclass that's not really an independent class. All it is is meant to be is an increment of a bigger thing, right? So now instead of looking at one giant uh, class that's 500 lines of code, you would now include, you know, I underscore blank packages, I underscore classes. That's just going to help kind of, you know, break everything down into subcomponents. <clears throat> Use defined types. Uh, how many people are using uh, parameterized classes? No? How many people are using defined types? Okay. How many, anybody using both? Okay. What, under what circumstances do you use one versus the other? No answer. That's exactly right. <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, I was just talking to Victor about this. Victor, Victor, everybody, say hi, Victor. Victor's from Stanford. Um, we were just talking about this. Define types are pretty much the same as parameterized classes. They have some different properties. Um, but the important thing here is to use them. Why? <clears throat> because if you can break down what you're doing repetitively into a well-specified module of some kind and, and encapsulate it in a defined type, it will make your life easier because you will be able to track where one change is going to affect all your other systems. So one of the reasons I, I recommend using defined types is just the way our usage pattern evolved. Excuse me, I need a beverage. Oh, that caffeine is amazing. Oh, yeah, I can feel it. It's right in my bones. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the ways that we use defined types, for instance, is, is we do a lot of overrides, right? So if we have a defined type that's going to be for SSH server and we want to pass in what ports to run on, if I have 500 systems that need to run in one particular way, but I only have two systems that need to run on a different port, I can use an override in a defined type. And I can't necessarily do that as easily with a, with a named class. So that's why we do it. But it's the exact same principle, right? <clears throat> so um, a defined type, as everybody knows, because everybody knows it, is, a, is something reusable with variables. I don't even need to talk about that. OK, you're all good. Uh, use templates where possible. One of the things at Stanford we decided is we want to keep as very little files uh, that we drop onto a system as possible. We wanted to make sure uh, early on we said, you know what, we're going to be really awesome and we're going to make native types for everything and uh, we're going to make defined types for everything and it's going to be awesome and we'll never drop files onto a system because everything will be modeled and uh, that never happened uh, because a lot of things are hard to model. So you are going to use files and we ended up using files. And one of the ways that we learned to sort of uh, condense the number of files we use is to use templates. So we use templates for a lot of things like Apache configurations. Uh, we use templates for things where we want to break down what's happening. Uh, you know, if it's a master server, it's going to have these lines of code. If it's something else, it's going to have these lines of code. It still, again, gives me a better place to go and figure out what's happening, right? I don't have to pull up five files and go, well, this is the file I put on this type of server. This is the file I put on that type of server. And then do a diff, right? If it's in a template, I can just read the code. Makes it easier. Uh, and using subclasses, a big proponent of subclasses, uh, and, and I propose subclasses over parameterized types, again, because we had a very specific need. We use our catalog a lot to figure out what's happening on a system. So if somebody wants to know how many systems do you have on your campus that you can connect to from off campus, we have a class for that. 
right? It's, if it's a parameterized class called SSH and I pass it as a variable, I can't just do a query uh, with something as easy as looking at a class.txt file, right? Classes.txt. But if it's a named subclass, and it is for us, it's called SSH uh, colon colon global, then I can easily figure out uh, what systems are using it and, and get that catalog. Uh, and subclasses do overrides, which I think is uh, amazing. Uh, overrides is one of the first features that I think I remember Luke was sitting at my office. And I think, did anybody use Puppet like, oh geez, what version was that even? Five years ago. But anyway, the overrides was, he was basically like, no, overrides are, are terrible. Nobody should do that. And I was like, yeah, we're going to want to do overrides. You're going to want to build that in, I think. So, uh, and we did. End of story. You're welcome. Keep things well named. Uh, so this kind of goes back to my previous point. Uh, if you are going to use something like a configuration management tool uh, or a uh, CMDB uh, or anything ITIL related, you're probably going to want to use what you're putting on your system as a way to figure out what's happening on the system and to communicate that with your bosses. So if you keep things well named, you can use these as triggers for what's happening. So again, going back to my SSH global, right, if I want to know what's happening on a system, if I named all my classes stupidly, I can't figure out what's happening. I don't think anybody does this, so I'm going to move on from that point. Uh, but it's useful when browsing a catalog, like I said, uh, and you're looking at what's happening. Um, and I can tell from the name alone what the expected behavior is, right? So this is another reason why I'll advocate for that. If I can't figure out why I can't connect to SSH from off campus, if I look at the name and it says SSH global, I, can, I know that it should be able to. But if it's a parameterized class, I can't do that from the name because what that class is supposed to do is hidden from me. It got passed in its variables and I don't know what they are. So we like at Stanford to name the classes based on the behavior that that, you put this little piece in here and this is what it's gonna do. Um, it's just, it's worked out well for us. So things like LDAP and LDAP master as a subclass, right? Now I know if LDAP master is a class applied to the system, it is an LDAP master. Or if it's LDAP replica, it is a replica. If I pass those things in as variables, into a named class, I would have no idea except to know that it works, that it does LDAP. Well, I probably knew that already because I'm looking at a directory server. I was trying to figure out if this was supposed to be behaving as a master, as a replica. Uh, packages versus Puppet. Uh, one of our policies internally was we don't distribute binary files over Puppet. Uh, we use Puppet for configurations and configurations only. This is really, uh, you know, Luke was talking about, you know, kind of like heresy. And, and things like that. Th th that's all this is. There's no, there's no reason why you can't do it. You can be stupid all you want. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> you know? But not in my turf, man. Uh, packages or anything compiled. There's actually a good reason for this. Uh, the reason you want to use packages for anything compiled is that packages are great for staging changes, right? So if you have a beta version of something, you can name it that. And it's easier to distribute that. There are environments, and we're going to talk a little bit about that is a good way to do change management, but packages are so much easier. So if you have a binary file and you're distributing through Puppet, it's really harder to kind of stage that out. But if you have a package, you just tell Puppet, on these dev servers, you install this version of this package. On a master server or on a production server, you install this version, and it works all beautifully. Um, and packages handle dependencies better. So again, Puppet is great at handling dependencies, right? It makes that magical graph web thing that I talked about. Um, that's the sign for graph web, uh, for those that don't know. But why do you want to model that in Puppet, right? If you have to install Apache, and Apache needs these 15 libraries and these 32 libraries, why would you want to model that in Apache? And the same thing with your internal code, right? If your internal code has all these dependencies, you can model that in Puppet. But if they're just package dependencies, you can just model that in your package, right? So you could even do things like a meta package that just says this is our, and I think uh, Martin talked a little bit about this, and. Uh, and if you watched uh, Sharif from Media Temple, they talked a little bit about this too. Or you can just have your package say, you know, these are my dependencies, this is what I need to do. They can save you a lot of lines of code. So we have like timeshare servers where uh, students log in and they expect to have 500 pieces of software on there. You know, we model all that stuff in Puppet right now, but if we just had one package and just told Puppet, install this package and then let the native tools under it do all the heavy lifting, it would actually cut down a lot on our server times. Uh, team practice, <clears throat> never make local changes. Uh, Luke talked about this in his keynote, and it's one of the things he and I agreed on. Uh, this is one of the problems that we had at Stanford, where you've got somebody, uh, it's the middle of the night, and something's happening, and Apache's down, and they get called, you know, and uh, 
they're trying to figure out what's happening, so you get on the server, right, and you start making changes. And five changes later, you figured out what it was. But I don't know about you, but me at two in the morning, I can't remember what the other four things I did were that were bogus, right? So if I make local changes, I'm gonna have these problems, right? Whew, problem's over, all right, go back to bed. Next morning, we gotta reboot the server. It comes back up, whoops, it doesn't work. Why? I don't know. I did stuff. What did you do? Pfft. It was two in the morning. I don't know. I don't know what I did. And we had these problems, right? We'd go to rebuild the server, right? But it's like, okay, we got this awesome puppet modeled server and everything builds and it's awesome, except this one little thing, so I just tweaked it. But I'll remember, it's cool. Then I go to build the second one and it doesn't work and I don't remember what I did. Uh, right? Because people say stuff like this. I'll go put it in puppet later. Later. Later never comes. And these are the people we all know, right? People that get punched at work, these are the people. Punch them in the face. Later never happens. So one of the rules we had, and it was one of the things I agreed with Luke, was we let Puppet change it back, right? So if you make a change in the system and you didn't commit it to Puppet, Puppet will change it back. Uh, and we like that. I think it's one of the greatest things about Puppet. It actually really, you know, I, I say these mean things, it really isn't about uh, <laughs> Bad code because it really is about the human problem, right? We forget these things, and, and Puppet can fix these mistakes for you. It can keep you from shooting yourself. So, uh, so, so going along with that, right? There's a solution to that problem of Puppet changing your systems, right? You lock Puppet. Does anybody know this one? It's beautiful. You just turn off Puppet. Now Puppet can't screw with you. Uh, so <laughs> that's a bad thing. Does anybody have a locking mechanism that they use for Puppet? Cool. Two, three people. Okay. So we actually came up with a, a cool little locking mechanism uh, at Stanford, and I'm happy to share it. It's not that difficult at all. Uh, there's a run file. If, you, if, you, if that run file exists, the Puppet client won't run. Uh, so we have that lock file we created, and we track who did it and why. So if I need to lock Puppet because I need to tweak something or uh, you know, I'm waiting for this package to rebuild before it gets installed, I can put that in there. And when I forget three days later and somebody goes, why is Puppet locked? They can look at that and go, Oh yeah, Diggant did that, and now he's gone somewhere on some mysterious adventure, and it's okay, we can change it back. Um, <clears throat> we also enforce a max time, so we have a nightly report that runs. Um, let's see, how many people get email reports? Okay, just a few people. How many people prefer a dashboard to the email reports? Oh, okay, hardly anybody. So more email port users than dashboard, okay, interesting. Interesting, so we actually get email reports. So one of the things we do is we have a, and I'll talk about customer reports a little bit later, we have something that watches and says, okay, this system hasn't updated in a while. You know, it's, lo it's locked or it's tangled or it's broken or somebody blew it this shit up. Somebody go look into this thing. Um, and so we watch for that, we watch for lock puppet clients and we report and then we can go and investigate. So again, because we want our systems up, we want them configured properly at all times. Server practices, Apache passenger, I think there's 25 people talking about Apache Passenger. It's good, use it. Uh, it scales, beautiful. Version control, how many people are not using version control? Okay, good. How many people are not using pre-commit syntax checks? Okay, okay, good. Um, pre-commit syntax checks are awesome because how many people have committed something and they left off the curly brace and it gets pushed out and now nothing compiles, right? Okay, that's acceptable. How many people have had a coworker do that? That's why we have the pre-commit syntax hook. Less punchy, more technology. Uh, and use Git, because it's awesome. I get paid by Git every time I say that. Uh, server practices, pick a security model. How many people uh, do, uh, let's see, uh, how many people have any kind of constraints around who can run Puppet on your system? Anybody? Okay, a couple of people. Uh, one of the things that we did, that we decided upon is we only have allow root control to a certain amount of users, and those are the same users that can run Puppet on that system. So it's a small thing, uh, but it's useful on who can use Puppet. Uh, but who can commit? How many have uh, any kind of locks around who can commit to your Puppet repository? Okay, good, good. We don't do that, but we want to. Anybody that can commit on Puppet can commit to any branch of our Puppet. Uh, that's a problem, but I think it's a great idea to kind of lock that down. Uh, certificates, so certificate handling, uh, one of the things that we decided internally is no system should be able to just auto-sign a Puppet, right? So Puppet client turns on, it makes a request for a certificate, 
You can configure the certificate authority to just go, oh yeah, pff, everybody's good, that's cool, let them do whatever, right? That's a bad idea. Why? Because what is your Puppet server called? Is it puppet.domain.com? Huh? Probably is, right? Ours is, ours was puppet.stanford.edu. That means when anybody in any department turned on their puppet and said, wow, puppet looks cool, I'm gonna try it out, it sent a certificate request to us. If we just auto-signed it, it would start configuring itself and probably get some of our uh, firewall rules, things that we don't want them to get. Um, also, how do you revoke your certificates? Anybody doing uh, certificate revocations? Cool, anybody, uh, anybody ever cleaning out their puppet certs when they turn off servers? So, good, okay. Um, I can't say we're 100% good at it, I don't think we use the revocation list. I think when we blow away a server, we just delete the certificate. But we do have a report that says, here's all the certificates I have. Uh, five of these systems don't even exist. Maybe you should do something about that. Customer reports. So this is the kind of thing I want to talk to you about. Uh, the email reports is something that we found probably the most useful. Uh, because if I have to go to a system and figure out what's happening, I'm probably not going to get around to doing that. But when I get an email in the morning, it's not that bad. I can just check in pretty easily. Uh, that's my mom outside, she's singing. She's excited for me. <laughs> what the hell is that? Uh, the last check report is something that just says, these puppet clients have not checked in the last 24 hours. Maybe you should look into that. So we talked a little bit about that. But here's another cool one we developed, and this is not like 100% foolproof, but it's called the Tangled Report. Uh, how many people have systems where a puppet is doing the same thing over and over and over again for days, and you don't even realize it, right? So we get that a lot too, right? Let's say there's a service that Puppet says should be running. Puppet runs, goes, oh, this thing should be running, it's off. Puppet tries to run it. 30 minutes later, Puppet goes, oh, this thing should be running, it tries to turn it on. This keeps happening. Well, that service never gets on, right? But it, Puppet doesn't realize it never got on. So we call that a tangled state, where Puppet is trying to do the same thing over and over again. So we made a simple little tool uh, where we track all the log reports from Puppet. And when a Puppet client makes another log report, it goes, is this log the exact same as it was last time? Because if it is, there's probably something wrong. Somebody needs to get punched. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, so we have this tangled report, which will then let us know that the systems have been, uh, there's something wrong with them and they need to get fixed. So the ITIL stuff, here's the stuff I really wanted to kind of talk to you guys about because this is gonna make you look good. So again, why ITIL? Uh, why ITIL is simple is because your boss has heard of it. And I know this is one of the directions, again, that Puppet Labs is looking to go into, is to do more of CMDB type stuff. And I know that we basically had that same measure, right? So we had somebody come to us and said, we're doing a CMDB. And I said, what's a CMDB? And they said, we don't know, but we want one. Because that's how management talks. Um, so, but, but, but Luke talked about this, right, in his, in his conference, that what happens? They give you an auditing tool. They give you an auditing tool that they want you to run on all your systems so it can tell them what's on your system, what's the make, what's the model, blah, blah, blah. Well, we have all that stuff in Puppet. There's no need to duplicate that, and I certainly don't want to run some third-party tool with root privileges on all my boxes that I don't know about. Um, so, there's, uh, so there's ways to deal with that, but I think, I think ITIL can be a good thing. When you have a large organization, you, know, you have to move up to that level where you're not just doing, you know, it's, it's kind of like moving from raw editing files to version control, right? It's a good thing, it's a small change, it's a good thing. ITIL is the same thing, it's just making recommendations on how to run things and it's trying to help people that don't know anything about computers management figure out how people should be doing things uh, to make things run better. So one of the ways we found to address that is environment support. Is anybody using environment support? Okay, not a lot of people. So environment support is something that we, we kind of had uh, put into Puppet because we wanted a way to stage changes. So we said, okay, if we've got Apache and we're configuring it this way, maybe this isn't the best way to do it, right? Yeah, we kind of screwed up those manifests. It really should look like this. Well, if we just make all those changes, that's 500 systems we could bring down if we screw it up, right? So we really want to go through a change manager process that where we let everybody know, we may bring down your systems because we may screw up this new manifest, but we're letting you know, right? That's change management. It's called you let people know ahead of time what you could be fucking up, and they tell you it's okay. So when it does, you go, I told you. I told you it could happen. So we use environments to roll that out so you can say, okay, these dev servers, I want to point to the master branch. It's going to be, you know, whatever the latest changes are. But these important production servers, we're going to point at a stable branch. And that stable branch we will test and we will roll out only when things are approved and they've gone through the clearance. Uh, and that's really kind of what environments are good for, change management. 
But here's one of the things we found is that there's not a lot of divergence between our master and our debt or our dev and our stable branch. So this is something that we didn't really predict. So this is one of our findings. So if you want to look into environment support, this is one of the things to consider. Do you really need it? Do you really have a stable? Because one of the things that we found is what changes a lot on a system? Well, for us, what changes is the users, right? We just hired a new guy. He needs to be on the system. We just fired a guy. He needs to get off the system. These are kind of changes that need to happen immediately. It can't be like, cool, well, the next change maintenance window is in two weeks, so we'll get that done. It's like, this guy's got to sit in his cubicle, and he needs to pretend like he's being busy, so you need to give him an account on everything. So, so these kinds of changes can't wait. So there's not really a lot that we put in a stable in dev. So that's just one of our asides, little findings. Um, so CMDB is another, like I said, that was, the, that was the big calling for us. CMDB is a change management uh, database. It basically holds information about your systems the same way Puppet holds information about your system, or store configs hold systems information. Um, so we wanted something that would integrate store configs. So anybody using store configs here? Yes? Excellent. Very few people. Uh, store configs, I hope everybody is at least familiar with store configs. Store configs is basically all that system information that your Puppet Master gets from your clients. It can take that and store it into a database. So you can now use that for other information. If you're using exported resources, you are using store configs uh, by default. So we started using store configs to get this information. Um, one of the things that uh, we found was that store configs was not able to work if you had a big system. So we came up with asynchronous store configs. So now your system, uh, so if you have a large manifest system and you're looking to roll this out, if you test this, I swear it'll work just fine. But once you roll out into production and all your systems are trying to do store configs at the same time, it's going to blow up. So use asynchronous store configs. It's helped us out a lot. Um, and then there's a technology out there. Or it's not technology. This is a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, a, it's not really a language. It's really kind of an XML spec, but it's a spec called CMDBF. So if your bosses are telling you about CMDB, you need to do it. Look into CMDBF. It's a, it's a way to kind of communicate change management information. Um, so it's one of the things we integrated in. Um, you can use custom data types. If you do need to integrate with the CMDB and you've got store configs, but you need to increase metadata or put metadata in uh, about like the services that are running, you can use custom defined types to do that. They don't do anything, but that name will show up in store configs. That'll help you. Uh, finally, one of the, I think, uh, last few lessons that we learned at Stanford. Again, a, a lot about management, I think. Luke talked about how there's like this divide, right, between People like us who are running systems and management, and we hate them and they hate us, and it's because we don't talk. One of the things I found is as soon as I started making tools to help management figure out what's happening in our puppet environment, uh, they were very happy. Um, so there's lots of ways to do this. Um, you can send them the email reports. One of the things that we do is we copy our boss uh, the email reports about our systems that are locked or systems that are tangled because they can see you know, hey, look, nightly stuff does happen, and then nightly we do fix things. I think they just get ignored, but we send them. Uh, Puppet Dashboard is another cool tool. I would recommend you guys set this up if you haven't. Uh, we, we don't use it. We made a, we made a tool. I'm going to show you a little bit about it um, in a minute here. But we made a tool similar to it called Malkovich, mostly because I needed a Java project to work on just for fun here. And uh, is this working? So. So kind of demo. So what this is kind of doing is just it allows my boss to go, okay, here's our tangled servers today, you know? Um, it's not mirrors. Oh, geez. <laughs> the mirrors and the magic, the fanciness. Let's see. You see that? Yeah, here we go. So now let's do it like this. So here we're kind of looking at a report here. So on the right, you know, a boss can go, okay, here's all our Tangle reports, and they can do a search. All this type of search functionality is available, I believe, in Puppet Dashboard, uh, but it's easy to do. Um, so you can design your own if you want for whatever reason, uh, like I did. Um, and then we can kind of show them our Puppet reports. So here's our log. So this is kind of what I was talking about Tangled reports, right? The server, for some reason, is trying to do the same damn thing every time, and they can look at that. What this does, this means nothing to them, right? This means nothing to management. But what we found, our experience was that they were happy to have this information. So I have no idea how do I get back to my thingy with the stuff on it. Um, so what I found is that this allows management to feel like we are giving them visibility in what's going on. Um, and that built sort of a trust around our culture of Puppet. Because to them, 
you know, Puppet means nothing to them, right? If they don't know anything about technology and we're telling them we're coming up with this great system that's gonna help us build, you know, and work faster, they, they don't understand that. But by giving them just simple functionality and simple, uh, not functionality, simple views into what's happening, we were able to build that trust culture and doing that uh, bought us a lot of leeway. So when stuff does happen, when things do break, when they have visibility, they're, they're a lot more, uh, they're a lot, they're a lot more understanding about the kind of problems that we have. Um, so work together. So you know, kind of conclusion. I, I think if you have a small group and it's growing bigger, and you're trying to figure out how do you make Puppet work, you know, Puppet's not just a technology. It really is sort of a new way of thinking about systems, right? If you have people that come on board that are using CF Engine or they've been using Chef or some other outdated model of of uh, configuring systems, they're going to have to kind of think differently, right? Because one of the things that I found. Every time we would get a new sysadmin, they want to kind of go, oh, where's my for loop? You know, I want to do a for loop, I want to do these things. It takes some time to kind of reframe the way you think in a puppet system, right? How you model something in a puppet world. Um, adopt a style guide, I swear, if you have a big team, this is going to make a big difference. I help out a lot. Keep it in puppet, do everything locally in puppet. Watch your logs, watch your reports. Finally, everybody's been showing pictures of their kids. I don't have any kids, but I made a movie, yay. All right, so there's a thing about my movie. Anyway, um, so that's it. Are there any questions about Puppet or how we do things at Stanford? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, you talked about exposing lots of reports to management. Um, does that unleash a lot of armchair sysadmins, like people with PhDs that think, well, I see this happened. Why don't you do this on this system? Okay, so the question was, since we've unleashed all these reports, do we end up with armchair admins who make unsolicited advice, give us unsolicited advice on how to manage it? Uh, no, that actually hasn't been a problem for us. Um, we, we are, I, I will say, we release reports not to our end clients. Uh, we, report, we release them only to our upper management, so that's like two or three managers in our group. Um, and they're very good about, you know, their management, we're the technical people, right? What they want to do as management is identify problems in the organization and then let us work on them, right? So if we tell them, look, we're already proactively looking for problems and working on them, they just go, sweet, I can go golfing a little bit earlier today. Just helps out. Any other, what other questions do we have? We have a lot of time. Go ahead. So uh, you mentioned problem with that people make local changes, uh, probably mostly in a troubleshooting scenario, but in any case, do you feel that that's like fundamentally The question was, I, I, I railed about people making local changes. Is that acceptable in a world where you can, are there scenarios where it is okay to kind of make local changes if you're doing it in a, in a nice way? I, I, think, I think ideally we always wanted to say you don't ever make local changes. But what, what we really found is if I'm troubleshooting a problem, I don't, know what, I don't know what's happening, right? Apache has like 500 configuration options and I don't know what's happening. I need to try something out. I don't want to keep making a commit and pushing it out and then letting Puppet pick it up and push it out there. So we did find that we, we needed to lock Puppet you know, multiple times, which is why we came up with the infrastructure. So what I would say is no, it's not, it's not a bad thing inherently to lock Puppet and do changes, but watch for that because what tends to happen, this is what, we ha this is what was happening to us before we put this monitor is that people would lock Puppet to work on something. Sometimes they wouldn't remember to put the changes back in Puppet. Or sometimes they wouldn't remember to unlock Puppet. Right, so that's the kind of problem you get into because it's like once you're done with the problem, it's three in the morning, you just want to go to sleep. So this is the way to do it. You either remember to put it in Puppet or you get a report that says Puppet is locked and then you go, oh, I unlocked Puppet. Then it undoes your changes and you go, oh, right, and I also didn't put it in Puppet. So, go ahead. That's, a, that's an interesting way to do it. That's pretty cool, actually. I like that. Other questions back here? Two questions. One, do you have uh, something like Puppet Tidy? Puppet Tidy. Actually, you can deploy your code in line. Um, and, and the second one is, how do you handle one-offs? So Puppet takes care of the consistency, but how do you handle situations where I want this thing to happen right now in boxes? 
So interesting question. Uh, the first question was, do we have something like Puppet Tidy to keep everything clean? No, we actually we don't have a Puppet Tidy. Um, so that would be, that's actually a good idea. We probably should look into something like that to, to make it consistent. Right now we just sort of spot check and we vet new sysadmins when they come on. You know, we basically get the roll of newspaper and it's like, that's bad style, bad you, and then rub their nose in it and then they go and they write better next time. Uh, the second question was how do we handle one off? So if you've got a system that I just want to build, do 10 things on it and then send it off to somebody uh, and that's never going to come back, how do we handle that? We actually don't have that need, so we haven't had to do that. Oh, interesting. So, so the question was, if we want Puppet to do something to a system just once and then not worry about it afterwards, um, there's a couple of ways that we've done that. We've done that in a few cases and we did something, uh, and I can't remember the specific tag, but you can do like, if you do an exec, you can have a tag that says, and it creates this file. And so if it create that file exists, don't ever do this again. So we've done things by wrapping stuff in that way. So we, that way we don't have to go in there and go, okay, commit this to Puppet, run Puppet once, and now go yank that crap out of Puppet again. We just go, look, this is gonna run once, it's gonna create this file called I'm done. If I'm done exists, don't do this again. And then it, and it just kinda goes on from there. So, small need though, we haven't had to do that a lot. So, any other questions? One, one question. One last question. Last question, you get the honor. Um, so the question was, because we have had some frustration with environments, how are we, are we still using them and how are we managing? We are still using the environments and, uh, and they are still providing a little bit of use for us. Um, for instance, I have, uh, anytime Puppet Masters, I want to upgrade, like right now we're looking at a 2.7 upgrade, I have one test 2.7 server that's on the master branch, the rest are on stable. Um, and again, this is where, you know, Git really comes in handy for us because we do make a lot of changes that need to go right away. Uh, that we make them right into stable and into master and using git merges is so much easier than doing subversion merges. So, you know, I mean, git has been a lifesaver. I don't think we would have done environment support until we moved to git. I think doing it with subversion was just a no starter. So, thank you very much. If you're in London next week, check out my film. Why would you be in London? Thank you so much, that was great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we have, go ahead. Okay, um, so we have about 10 minutes until our next talk, which is about automated deployment with SeedBank and Puppet. Um, and in the other room, we have trust is the cornerstone of DevOps. Um, and I don't think there's anything going on in the breakout sessions, but there is coffee upstairs if you want some. So, see you in 10.